Overuse injuries are particularly um, prevalent in children and young athletes. This is basically because they are still growing and developing. So as a child or young athlete is uh, grows, they need more protein, they need more vitamins and more minerals, uh, more calcium for their bones, like all of, all the things that they need for uh, general adaptation uh, with exercise. So if they're doing training and stuff, the normal things that um, cause physiological adaptations uh, also are the things that your body will need in order to grow and develop. And so uh, if you have uh, children who are participating in lots and lots of sport, they become more susceptible to overuse injuries. So general overuse injuries that exist are uh, stress fractures, which are uh, small breaks in bone, and often they result from uh, either really uh, lots of large impacts, so uh, road running, for example, uh, where you're running on concrete all the time, uh, can lead to stress fractures. Uh, and then the other one that is fairly frequent is uh, tendonitis. So tendonitis comes in various forms, but basically the tendon that attaches the muscle to the bone uh, starts to get small little tears in it, which uh, cause inflammation. And if the athlete doesn't rest long enough for those to repair properly, uh, then you get more and more little tears uh, and the inflammation stays there and it remains quite painful. One of the things here too is I think uh, if when someone grows suddenly, so often uh, growth spurts are quite quick. So you might not grow for a year, but then over one month you'll, you'll grow a good uh, 12 centimetres or something. Uh, and so that actually co causes a few issues, particularly for your muscles. So if your bones grow, normally they are getting some nutrients in order to do that. Uh, they'll be a bit weaker straight after they've grown. But what they do when they do that is stretch the muscle, uh, which makes them more prone to things like tendonitis because a stretched muscle can possibly have already small tears. Uh, it needs to be stretched. It needs to be looked after so that it actually adapts to the new length of bone that it's now uh, attached to. Uh, and so the, it might mean that the athlete requires more time uh, to recover from any kind of small injuries or needs to make sure that they're actually got regain their flexibility before they participate in sports. Uh, so implications for how children and young athletes engage in sport. Uh, one of the key things for avoiding overuse and injuries is to make sure that these children and young athletes are getting a variety of sports. You want them to be doing swimming, bike riding, running, uh, playing games like soccer, cricket, whatever, uh, with a variety of different movements. So they're not just producing the same movement over and over again because when they're doing that, uh, you're causing small amounts of damage all the time because this is how um, physiological adaptations work. You're causing small little bits of damage which then require um, time to heal and to adapt to the stress that the, has been put on them from the sport or from the training or whatever. So if they're doing uh, the same sport over and over and over again, uh, then the rest periods in between their training need to become uh, longer. Whereas if they're doing a variety of sports, they don't need the same kind of, um, kind of rest periods. They can do soccer one day, cricket the next day, ride a bike another day. Because uh, variety then means that actually parts of your body are getting rested uh, while other parts are being used. It's important that they have rest periods. Uh, so even with variety, they still need some kind of rest periods to make sure that um, particular body parts are not getting used for a while so that they have a chance to recover, to rebuild, to repair, etc. Uh, if a child does get injured, very, very important that they are completely and fully recovered before they come back to sport. Uh, so they need to be approved uh, and checked off by their medical specialists, by their physio, uh, whoever's looking after them with that injury. Uh, they need to tick off and say, yes, you are completely recovered. You're ready to go back uh, to doing training and possibly then still have some kind of guidance in how they um, progress back into exercise and have that um, moving from a lower intensity up to the higher intensities again. Uh, to make sure that their body copes with that. In terms of management of overuse injuries, uh, rest, number one thing that they need, and a health professional should always be involved, uh, particularly with children and overuse injuries. You want to have a physio, an exercise physiologist, a doctor, an osteopath, um, uh, some kind of health professional overseeing it and being in charge of the treatments that are given and what timing uh, exists for when the child is going to come back to doing particular movements and particular sports. Another consideration for children and young athletes is thermoregulation. So thermoregulation is particularly important because children have not fully developed their thermoregulation. Uh, the mechanisms that our body uses to maintain our body temperature 
uh, are less developed in children. Uh, they don't sweat as well. They don't uh, transfer their blood to their skin as efficiently. Uh, but also, they have a greater surface area to body mass ratio. And what that means is that when I have a child, uh, they have more skin uh, compared to their body mass. So they might weigh 40 kilos but have a really large skin surface area compared to an adult who'll have a larger body mass, like 80 kilos, and their skin surface area, though it's a bit more, the ratio between them has become uh, better. And so the, uh, the adult is more able to maintain their body temperature and requires less effort to maintain their body temperature than a child. Uh, so the way I often think about it is when you're trying to cook potatoes uh, or something, if you take the whole potato and chuck it in boiling water, it takes longer for that whole potato to cook than if I cut that potato into tiny little chunks and then put it in the water. The tiny chunks cook faster and they cook faster because they have a larger surface area to body mass ratio. Okay, so it'll, the larger surface area means that the external environment, the temperature around uh, the person or the potato uh, can actually uh, has more, more ways to get into the body uh, to either add heat to the body or to take heat away from the body depending if it's cold or hot. Uh, and so the child, because their surface area is larger, they have to do more in order to maintain their body temperature. So if it's cold, they've got to do more shivering uh, than an adult does in order to maintain their body temperature. And if it's hot, a child needs to sweat more, they need to send their blood to their skin faster, um, and they need to make sure that they're losing uh, their heat uh, in that way. But if it's hot around them, it makes it more difficult. So that greater surface area to body mass ratio, very important when it comes to thermoregulation for children and young athletes. Um, so essentially what that ends up meaning is that children and young athletes, they can overheat up to three to five times faster than adults. And the same will go for, for um, when they get too cold as well. They're going to do that a lot faster than an adult. In terms of the implications, when we have children and young athletes engaging in sport, that will depend on whether it's hot or cold. So here, if it's hot, you want to make sure you give them more drinks breaks. Uh, maybe every 15 minutes, you're going to stop play. All right, guys, go get a nice drink. Uh, you might even make sure that the drinks are cold uh, because it'll help to reduce their body temperature and provide them with the fluid uh, that they're going to be losing through their sweat. Uh, you might want to try and avoid playing in the heat of the day. And so you might play early in the morning. And you might notice if you are involved in sports, a lot of uh, young kids' sports are actually played early in the morning, particularly if it's on the weekend, uh, on during summer. Uh, if possible, you might want to keep them out of the sun. So if it's a nice hot day, you might go into the hall where there's shade. You might go underneath some trees or something. Uh, find a space where you can do your exercise where you're out of direct heat. Uh, and make sure they're wearing appropriate clothing and also sun protection and stuff. So if it's hot, you want light clothing that breathes really easily. Your implications for cold weather are essentially you want to make sure your kid has a longer warm up because uh, you want to make sure that their body has actually reached a good temperature for participating in sport. It'll help to reduce the number of injuries that they have and also that they're wearing appropriate clothing. Uh, you don't want to have them going out uh, snowboarding in shorts and a singlet. You want to make sure that they're all rugged up so that they're not going to get too cold. In terms of management uh, with thermoregulation, uh, you want to manage either heat stroke or heat exhaustion, which are both essentially hyperthermia, so when they're too hot, um, or you have to manage hypothermia when someone has gotten too cold. So if they're too hot, you're going to remove them out of the sun, put them in the shade. You want somewhere where the wind uh, will blow across them or set up a fan that will blow across them. Uh, you might put some wet packs on them, so get some uh, cloth that's kind of cool and wet, and you might put that on them, and you'll notice you might put the... Uh, in key places where arteries are close to the skin. So that's in your neck up here, under your arms, and in your groin. Uh, that'll help to reduce their body temperature faster. You might give them uh, some water to drink. Uh, but again, you're not looking at giving them freezing cold water. You want to bring their body temperature down slowly, not, not really, really quickly. Uh, then when we come for hypothermia, where they're too cold, uh, first thing you want to do, if they're wet, take off all their wet clothing, and if you can, replace it with dry clothing or a blanket or something. You want to be able to use uh, our body temperature, and so a blanket or something will help to, uh, to slowly heat us up and not to do it quickly. Uh, you could use some kind of warm drink. You don't want a hot drink, but maybe, um, you know, like a 
30 degree uh, glass of water rather than what you would have done for the hyperthermic person where you're giving them some cold water. You want to give them some warm water. Um, you want to make sure that there's some kind of natural kind of nice warmth around them. Uh, you're not going to give them big heat packs and stuff. You could use some kind of um, heat mechanism like that if it was at a low-ish temperature. Uh, but if it's at a quite a high temperature, what you're actually going to end up doing is burning them um, because their body's already cold. So you want to make sure that whatever heat pack thing that you might choose to use is actually at a fairly low temperature. Uh, and that's essentially your management for uh, hyperthermia or hypothermia. Resistance training is often debated for kids and quite frankly, like since I've gone to uni, I don't understand why. So I went to uni, I did exercise sports science back in like 2002 to 2004 um, and I was very much taught when I was there that resistance training is perfectly fine, perfectly safe for kids. Uh, in essence, it's probably safer than a lot of other sports that kids engage in because it's generally more uh, monitored, it's more it's precise, uh, and it's prescriptive, whereas other games, other sports, that's not quite as prescriptive. Kids tend to run around and uh, do what they like when they're doing it, whereas when they're doing resistance training, it tends to be a lot more focused and, and uh, supervised. So it's not really dangerous. It won't stunt growth. Uh, in fact, if anything, it can help growth. Uh, if you break a bone doing resistance training, you've been doing something majorly wrong, uh, acting like a complete kind of idiot in there. Um, so it's not going to break your growth plate. That's a very, very rare thing to happen. Uh, and generally happens when people are in there, you know, I'm going to see how much I can lift and lift more than the person next to me and we're going to just push it out as much as we can. Uh, that's when you start to have injuries. Whereas if you do resistance training uh, the way it's meant to be done, then generally it's very safe for children and young athletes. So some of the implications for how resistance training is done. So you want to make sure that um, you cater to the age of your athlete. So we have a look at this table here. For the ages six to nine, light resistance, we're looking at 15 reps and more. So the kid has to be able to lift it more than 15 times when they're lifting that weight. Uh, once they hit uh, nine to 12 years of age, you want to start using body weight because you'll actually notice that your body weighs a fair bit. Um, and so our six to nine year olds are not using body weight so much. They're doing light resistance, really light, uh, lots of reps. Uh, most kids aren't going to be able to do 15, 20 push-ups because your body actually weighs a fair bit. Um, at 9 to 12 years old, you might also use a few simple free weights. Uh, you might start to introduce some dumbbells um, or barbells or something like that. And you still you, your maximum intensity is around a 10 RM. Okay, So we're still not doing 1 RMs and 3 RMs or anything. Uh, and RM is a repetition maximum, so that means that I can lift it 10 times, but I cannot lift it 11 times. Okay, so that's our maximum intensity for resistance training for our 9 to 12 year olds is a 10 RM. Uh, when we come to the 12 to 15 year olds, it drops down to 8 RM. Uh, again, we're using body rate. We're going to start to introduce more free weights. Might start to use some machines as they start to get around the size where they actually suit the machine. Because machines generally will only cater to a certain range of body size. Um, they want to avoid complex movements unless they've been trained. So a complex movement like a uh, clean and jerk, a squat, uh, requires really good technique and so until you've been taught really good technique really no one should be doing those movements unless they've been taught how to do them properly um, and they want to start with light weights doing that and slowly progress into the higher weights um, so 12 to 15 year olds avoiding complex movements uh, unless they've been specifically trained for it and then 15 to 18 year olds they're starting to look more like adults the training starts to become more like adults they can do 6 to 15 RMs um, they can start to use the more complex movements, again, provided they've been taught how to use it, how to do it with the correct technique. So those RMs are essentially our intensity for training. So in terms of making sure things are age appropriate for athletes, it essentially means your intensity uh, should be appropriate for them at their age. You will always want to emphasize technique for anyone who's doing kind of resistance training stuff because uh, bad technique for anyone will cause injuries. You want to make sure that they're supervised by someone who knows what they're doing. So at the very least, I would say a personal trainer uh, and then moving your way up into exercise scientists, exercise sports scientists, exercise physiologists and stuff uh, who are 
um, that have greater training levels essentially in exercise and lifting and training and particularly dealing with children and young athletes as well. Uh, and you want to make sure that you do a whole body focus with your resistance training. So what that means is essentially that you want to make sure that when you train the kid's chest, you also train their back. Uh, if you're training the front of their legs or the front of their core, you want to train the back of their trunk and you want to train their hamstrings and stuff as well. Make sure that you're not going to cause an imbalance in the body. Uh, and that's particularly one of the reasons why uh, we often don't um, split up the training for kids until they're about 15. So normally you're uh, 15 years and younger. Uh, the athlete, generally speaking, will do a whole body session and then that'll be it. Whereas... Uh, as you start to get older, you start to split things up and so one day you'll do chest, one day you'll do back, one day you'll do shoulders, one day you'll do legs or you might do legs in the morning, shoulders in the afternoon and stuff and so it starts to become more complex but that doesn't get introduced really until they're 15 to 18 years old uh, at least. Uh, resistance training in terms of managing uh, resistance training, you want to make sure there's a professional as I mentioned before. So Exercise Sports Science Australia, uh, your registered body for people like exercise scientists, exercise sports scientists and exercise physiologists. Uh, and so if you have one of those professionals, you are definitely very well looked after. Um, on your alternatives are essentially people who have uh, diplomas in fitness or your personal trainer is your certificate to, uh, for in fitness. You want to make sure that any injuries are treated. So if there's any kind of injury uh, that happens to the athlete, to the child or young person, you want to make sure that they are properly treated, properly assessed, physios involved, doctors involved, maybe an exercise physiologist is involved, make sure that treatment is done, and then make sure they get adequate rest periods. So resistance training is always minimum 48 hours between when you train one body part and when you train it again. So our 15 and unders, they essentially have to have a whole day break um, so if they train on Monday, they're not training again until Wednesday, uh, roughly the same time. That's your 48 hour break. Uh, for your older athletes, they might do um, chest on Monday, back on Tuesday, and then they can do chest again on Wednesday, uh, making sure that there's a rest periods in between. But within that, so you, you want to have 48 hours between training sessions, but at some point, so maybe every six to eight weeks, you also want to include like a week long break. And then every uh, six months or something, you might include a whole month break. Uh, so you want to make sure they're actually getting good breaks in uh, that are appropriate to the um, time level and type period of training.